most smartly and creatively and should have the room to do that. Uh, I'm not going to touch on all these. You heard plenty over the last two weeks about this list. I just want to highlight a couple um, for purposes of kind of an overview. Uh, workforce would be the first thing I think we need to highlight because there was not a single presentation out of the 14 that didn't mention that. Um, and it's not just physicians and nurses, as I think you heard. It's, it's people all along the continuum of care and throughout the hospital. So it's IT people. And you're not only competing with UVM Medical Center and other hospitals for IT people, you're competing with other kinds of companies that need that expertise. Um, so it's not just, it's not just um, uh, care, uh, caregivers in that, in that category. And of course, as I mentioned in my public comment a week ago um, at the UVM Medical Center hearing, um, it also creates wage pressures and cost issues um, across the state as we try to manage those, those, um, those challenges. Um, next, I would just talk about bad debt very briefly. I think you heard many, if not all, the hospitals talk about how they do see um, a growing number of bad debt. We are compiling that on a system-wide basis, and it does appear that, that bad debt looks to be in close to the range of pre-Affordable Care Act levels. Um, as, as Tim Ford mentioned in his presentation, the Affordable Care Act is under constant assault, um, whether it's suspending the CSR payments um, or creating uncertainty um, in the insurance market, which is, which is a continual problem um, that, that contributes to the bad debt issue. Um, and then I would say as far as the final challenge I would highlight on here, um, it's, it's really the challenge that I mentioned earlier, trying to do all the things hospitals are expected to do routinely and every day, community benefit and caregiving, but then also moving into this risk-based payment arrangement um, and doing it while you're, as you've heard, a small hospital, a small hospital in a struggling community, a small hospital maybe with a very thin margin or a negative margin, and still saying, I understand the importance of this, and I'm in, and I'm working on it. So I just think that's something else to keep in mind. Um, to, to extend the federal pressures um, conversation a little, I think hospitals left this out. You did hear from a couple. Um, Tim, I thought, was articulate about talking about what he views federal pressures, but most hospitals didn't talk about it. What you did hear from almost every hospital um, that came before you was that 340B is critical. Um, it is literally the bottom line maker for many of their uh, for, for many of these hospitals. And I just want to I just want to emphasize one point on 340B. In addition to what the hospital said about its importance, is that I think it's worth reminding everyone who pays attention to these issues and has a stake in it that 340B the program does not involve taxpayer dollars. Really important to remember. These dollars that create the savings come from pharmaceutical companies. Um, and then the last thing I want to say on this slide. Um, is that whether we're talking about payment rules that, that occur at the federal level, so that could impact things like your dish payment, your Medi uh, Medicare-dependent hospital status, um, all of those sort of um, Medicare categories that can change and swing budgets a million or two or three million dollars at a time or even more. Um, but there's one thing that's not on the slide here that I think may represent the greatest federal pressure going forward, and that is the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act of 2017. Um, as you probably know from just following the news, the, the tax cut law that was passed late last year um, adds $2 trillion to the deficit over the next 10 years, and that's a conservative estimate. Healthcare economists widely agree that some of the impacts of this will be a higher budget deficit. That's not even um, up for dispute. Greater income inequality across the country, and then the two most important things for our purposes, significantly lower healthcare coverage and significantly higher healthcare costs. And if, uh, as I sort of prepared for this and looked at some of the research that's out there on this topic, I found a fascinating article that I would encourage you to look at from the June 18 article of the American Journal of Public Health that looks at the implications for healthcare of the tax cut bill, um, the law. Um, number one, that it would erase some of the ACA coverage gains that we've made over the past many years. That it would diminish significantly funding for public health and simultaneously put pressure on Medicare and Medicaid at the federal level, which of course then endures to the states. Um, and then three, will significantly increase the rates of uninsurance, which is likely to lead to higher levels of uncompensated care. Um, and on that front, I'll just read one brief passage from the article that I think is really important. Increases in uncompensated care, in turn, will shift the cost of caring for the uninsured from insurance programs to hospitals and health departments. 
Such a shift will almost certainly deflect both finances and attention away from the growing efforts to have community health providers, hospitals, and health departments invest in public health, the social determinants, and prevention. Um, so, you know, growing debt means finding um, spending reductions elsewhere in the system, and Medicare and Medicaid are prime targets because they are big pieces of the budget. Um, and so I just think as we look forward, uh, one final passage here says, efforts to maintain these entitlement programs in an era of debt fears could have serious effects on public health by cutting discretionary programs such as those admi administered by the CDC and others that fund the nation's public health infrastructure. So I, I just mentioned that by way of, of, of demonstrating how significant the federal pressures can be. And as we look out, um, that, that the, both the decimation of the Affordable Care Act and the implications of that tax law um, could be quite significant. Um, so I think that the Green Mountain Care Award and hospitals alike deserve great credit. Um, we are quick to cite the statistic about $600 million in cost savings since the um, advent of the Green Mountain Care Board. Um, and, and I think that's something that both the board and hospitals should share, um, should share sort of credit for helping to achieve. I would just hope as you evaluate this year's budgets, um, two things. One, to take a systemic view. Um, clearly, it's your job to regulate every single hospital in the system. Um, but I encourage you to keep a statewide perspective in mind. Um, as I mentioned uh, earlier to this board, I, I view our system as very small and interwoven and interdependent. And for that reason, what happens in one place um, is, is potentially impacts the entire system and, and worth um, making sure we always keep the broader perspective. Um, and then secondly, that as we work um, in this regulatory framework, squeezing hospitals too much or putting too much pressure on them, um, I really do think can threaten their ability to make the needed investments in health reform and the activity that's so promising in the space of the all-payer model and accountable health communities. So just to close, I think um, probably the most important thing uh, that, I would, that I would close with is that we all share the same goal, um, which, is, which is really to achieve the AAA, right? Better care at a lower cost with greater patient satisfaction. That's why we're all here. That's the work that I know hospitals are engaged in every day. It's the work they're passionate about. Um, and I think you saw from the quality of the presentations um, over the past two weeks, I mean, I was, I'm always just amazed at, at, at the quality of, of, of the people who work in these organizations um, and their attention to that issue. And I would just also say that part of the equation here is making sure that not only do we have an affordable system, which is so important, but also that we have a sustainable one um, and long into the future. And so that the actions we take today um, impact our ability to have that system um, for the long haul. So, um, so I'm just going to close by saying thank you again, both for the opportunity to be here today and for listening so carefully to the hospital stories. This is a complex constellation of issues that you have to think about, um, lots of moving parts. So I just um, ask that you, that you do so by looking at every issue that's been presented and thinking about how those all work together. Um, and that you remember hospital's motive in all this. Uh, which is really to do the right thing for the patients and the communities they serve. And with that, I will stop. Thanks so much. Thank you, Jeff. That has been very clear throughout the budget processes. The dedicated people that we have working in the hospital system in Vermont and uh, probably speaks volumes for why we're always ranked at the top when it comes to outcomes as well in comparison to other states. So, Mike, I was trying to give you time to get up there. <laughs> I didn't want to interrupt you. You're waxing away. So whenever you're ready, go ahead. Um, I, I, I'll start by uh, echoing a lot of what Jeff said. Um, I think uh, this is a really important process. And, um, and I'm sure that despite uh, one press person having been here for much of it, um, most Vermonters don't know about it. And um, so I, I really want to thank everyone who participates in it as well. Uh, it's more important than Vermonters know. I also want to say that I appreciate the board's efforts at um, finding a way to, to, uh, uh, to connect the different regulatory processes um, it, it, um, it's a bit awkward for us, and I think for, um, and I think for the board, 
to have one regulated entity in front of them uh, and, at, and have both, as Jeff said, and a, uh, a focus on that hospital's performance and what that hospital's doing and a system-wide approach at the same time. Um, when we ask the question, is your proposed rate affordable? Um, I understand why, uh, whether it's a large hospital or a small hospital or another regulated entity, uh, why they squirm and why they um, uh, have, a, you know, to some degree, why are you looking at us? We're just one little piece in this big system. Um, so uh, it, it is somewhat frustrating from my perspective that, um, that, that many, uh, many of these entities say, you know, look at the other guy. And it's, we both have to ask that question. It's appropriate to ask it of every hospital, and it's unfair to ask it of every hospital uh, and, every, and, and insurance company, because this, the systems are indeed so interrelated. I also think um, about affordability. Uh, everybody knows that um, many Vermonters can't afford the care that their um, that their providers are uh, Many providers, many uh, everybody knows that uh, affordability is a, a, a basic access, a challenge to access. And I think everybody knows it's sort of basic when a cost goes up more people can't afford it. So, sort of, I uh, uh, just want to say it on the sort of easiest way, you know, I mean, if we're talking about milk, um, you know, if the cost of milk goes up and you don't have enough money, it, um, so uh, it, it's nothing sort of mystical about it. It's, a, it's, it's a, a basic thing that I think all of us know. It doesn't get us very much further in this very complex system, um, but, uh, but I think it's important to make it simple. I also just want to speak for just a moment about uh, what it means when the board approves a rate for the hospitals. Um, in answer to our questions this, uh, this season, uh, by and large, most hospitals said uh, that they considered a rate from the board to be uh, a fixed rate, to be something that um, that they, that they didn't negotiate uh, with the carriers over. Um, I don't know exactly uh, um, whether the board means it that way or whether um, the insurance companies, under, you know, how the insurance companies should understand it, but I do know that there's something of a disconnect. And so my, my one request, as you consider your, your, the hospital budgets before you, uh, is that any clarity you can provide so that um, so that uh, when we see a, um, uh, a decision by the board about what the rates for the hospitals will be, uh, we'll have a common understanding of just what that's supposed to mean, both to that hospital and to the insurance companies and to people. Um, so with that, I, I really want to thank you again and um, appreciate both the board and uh, all the stakeholders who put so much energy into this. Thank you. So at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Pat to begin to uh, lead us to uh, where we need to go. And we have a limited timeline. Our decisions will be made by September 14th. We've written decisions by September 28th, I think it is. And um, so basically, my goal, um, and I've expressed this to Pat, is that um, we begin the process today. We we'll begin to see what our decision points are. And for the board members, if we could start to uh, really figure out a path, and I would say similar to last year, um, it seems like we should be able to make some decisions on certain hospitals uh, as soon as next week. Um, not that, not saying that it's just uh, that we would uh, accept what's been presented but some may have logical um, decision points that we could decide fairly quickly. And then, of course, the problems will be the following week. Um, and we may have to have an, an extra board meeting the week of the 12th. Um, but we'll play that by ear and see how we, how we go. So 
So with that, I'll turn it over to you, Pat. Great, thank you. Thank you so much, Chair Mullen. Um, for the record, Pat Jones, Director of Health System Finances with the Green Mountain Care Board. I'm joined here by Lori Perry and Kelly Thoreau. Um, I want to repeat again what heroic work um, these two folks have done over the past um, a couple months at this point um, to pull together staff analysis. Um, really help shape the process and um, just be overall fantastic team members. So thank you both of them and many others. Um, so what we um, what we want to do today is uh, just try and lay out what the decision points are um, before the board and try to give you some summary information for each hospital. You know, we'll do it as, as um, efficiently as we can, but there are really, um, while, while the focus is on net patient revenue and on um, the rate increases or, um, or rate changes, there's, sort, there's a lot of other areas that you all need to um, make decisions on along the way to get to those two um, decision points. So um, obviously um, the key metric is um, NPR growth. And um, within that, you'll see that um, some of the hospitals have recommended adjustments um, for provider transfers and acquisitions and ACO accounting changes and um, other such things. And so those are some decisions that we'll just need to either confirm or if they've already happened or, um, or um, verify or not. Um, so so that, just, yes. Can we interrupt as you're going? To? Yeah. So I would just say on that, I think that um, a lot of what we'll do is defer to the staff analysis when it comes to um, the acquisitions and the provider transfers. But what we clearly would want to make sure is that it's within the time frame that's allowed. So for example, Central Vermont Medical Center had a practice, I believe that doesn't start till October 1, correct? That's correct. So yeah. that would really be um, not part of this year's considerations in my viewpoint. Right. Um, that would, you know, what we'll do is make recommendations on each of those adjustments or um, layout if they've already been approved. Um, that's a good example of something because those adjustments are really to the fiscal year um, 18 base, which is the base from which NPR growth is calculated, um, something that is not effective in fiscal year 18 is not likely to be a candidate to have an adjustment. So can I just add to that the other piece to look at, appreciate it, the staff could look into is the idea behind that physician transfers and acquisitions was to take existing services that were already in the community and if they're just getting moved because of change of ownership, it, it could be an off ramp for NPR. If it's a new service, then I think it's treated differently. I think it'd be you know good to go look back at the actual uh, rule, but language around that. Because I think there's some physician transfers and acquisitions that may fall into the category of new service. And I think, um, Pat, we talked about this briefly, but there is, um, there was the legislation and then there was a policy enacted. The legislation was a little fuzzy on whether it was just physician transfers, but it does recognize that was um, for the benefit of consumers so they would uh, notify patients, but does, we, our policy did recognize that um, both in and out, but it does talk about existing services, so it's not it is not supposed to be a new um, a new a new service for the community. And the reason it was recognized, as I recall, back in the original policy that the board did, was not only because the legislature had a stew of policy, but because um, we were recognizing it was part of the overall healthcare community, and that it would not have um, the same impact had they put in a new. Um, practice out of nowhere that was not there before. Correct. Thank you. Um, we also have health care reform investments that um, will obviously impact whether or not a hospital um, is considered for the 0.4% health care reform allowance. Um, so that's another area that we'll need to look at in terms of NPR growth. 
So when, when you're looking at that, um, one of the things that became clear is that uh, Mom and Scott, you should have some type of accounting. Uh, and it, it seems to me that we were pretty specific on which reform investments would be allowed this year so it wouldn't be as wishy-washy as in the past. And again, we would look for the staff to make recommendations on whether or not uh, the investments truly are within the parameters that were laid out. Right, and I'll note that Melissa Miles um, from our staff has um, done a very good job of reviewing and um, summarizing um, the health care reform investments. I have a slight comment here. I feel like we're going to a little stronger. But yeah, we're just all <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> but, <laughs> yeah we'll next week. but one of the other things that occurred to me this year and hadn't occurred to me in the past, and I did take the time to look at each of the health reform investments, but if a hospital has taken a health reform investment in the past for a program or a service, let's just say, and then discontinued that. I did look at that. Okay, well, I was going to say, can I just finish and then yeah. you definitely jump yeah. in? It's in the base. <coughs> that health reform investment is in the base and then it's growing um, because of the NPR that's growing. So I just think we should somehow factor that in or just look at it to see if there are prior health reform investments that were in the base that were now discontinued and now there's an ask for an additional health reform investment that may be related or unrelated, but I just want to make sure that we're capturing that. It doesn't mean that we wouldn't necessarily approve the health reform investments that are proposed, but I just think we should be looking at things that were uh, introduced and then discontinued. And I did look for that and I didn't find any that were discontinued. Okay, perfect. This year. Great. Thank you, Anna. And Jeff? Okay. Um, we already talked about other proposed adjustments. Those include um, uh, just a couple of notable ones. Um, Brattleboro um, believes that we inadvertently um, reduced our NPR in 18, and so that's a, um, an adjustment that we'll need to look at. And then... Um, so while you're on that one, let's take them one at a time. <laughs> let's try to get some uh, decision points made today. Can so we do that when we're actually talking about the hospital? Okay, we can do that. Because there's a page on each hospital, so all of my notes are on each of those pages. <laughs> okay. We'll follow Robin's suggestion. <laughs> Thank you, Robin. <laughs> um, and, I slide, not <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm wondering if I'll, I think a metric will be can I get through a sentence? <laughs> I think I can. Um, and then, um, um, obviously, another key decision point for you is um, what to do regarding the rate, in this case, all came in with rate increases this year. Now, um, some other areas of inquiry that aren't on the slide, that, but that have clearly um, been discussed throughout the last two weeks are, first of all, um, how, um, a, how hospitals are uh, booking their ACO um, risk and reserves to cover that and so that's an area that you may want to weigh in on. Obviously, we heard that hospitals are doing it differently. It's new. They're getting their um, different um, advice from auditors and so forth. But um, clearly, um, for the future, some standardization as we embark on this new journey um, with the ACO on how to account for um, that reserve to cover the risk is, is going to be important. And then, um, you know, one piece of guidance that the board gave to hospitals when we were actually issuing the guidance was um, to discuss how they come in against their 18 actuals. We asked that as a standard question. Um, what are your projections for 18? We asked them to update that during their presentations. Um, and especially for some of those hospitals that are um, you know, continuing to be over, but also the ones that are coming in under as well, um, that might be another area of consideration as well. So I will um, stop there for a moment and see if you think um, we missed anything that we haven't already discussed, any other um, areas where you think um, you're on the hook to make decisions. So if I could jump in. Um, I would add the CON follow-up. So uh, one of the areas we needed to look at was 
was specific to a change in the CON law. Um, and I actually have a proposal about how we do that, which would be not that we try to do all of that follow-up and analysis in the next two weeks, but that we include something in the budget order for those hospitals that addresses the need to do that follow-up so that we have the opportunity to do it, but it's not a huge lift for the staff. And if, the, and if you guys need help identifying which, I asked the, I sort of went through all the CON uh, information in the packets and tried to identify the hospitals where, that I think we need more information and asked that during the hearings, but I can go back through my list with you if that's helpful. Great, thank you. So the one comment I would make here is on the question on how hospitals were treating the uh, ACO risk, I, I think we've had several conversations, Pat, and I, I think that we would really look for uh, Jeff and Michael and people from Laws to uh, uh, work with your team to try to figure out a way that uh, basically their standardization. Uh, we, we should be able to, as a board, uh, put out a request for information for uh, the budget approval that gives us information that's standardized so it's not being treated differently by different hospitals. And, the ACO risk is just one example of how sometimes it's not apples to apples. So I think that, um, not to layer on work to you, but I think that's something that's gonna to have to occur uh, after we get through this year's process to uh, convene a group along with VAS to try to create better standardization as far as the financial statements. Yeah, um, I think the staff concurs with that. Um, Kelly is sort of our resident expert on all things ACO, but um, we agree that there, there's been enough um, questions or uncertainty, and everybody's um, definitely doing the best that they can um, in, in the accounting for the ACO, not only the risk, but the revenues and so forth, but we, um, we agree that there call the off season, which I'm not sure there actually is one. But, um, but we agree that, um, that 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 will be a good time to really um, work with um, those who are directly involved to try and standardize. We're actually going to insist that you have some type of off season pattern. You know, receiving emails after two o'clock in the morning is a little bit crazy. <laughs> it's a long standing pattern. <laughs> standardization, I completely agree with you on the standardization. Um, just in general, there were some hospitals that did not book fixed payments in their budgets, but you know, declared in their narratives that they were in negotiations or planning to be in the all-payer model with one care. So I'm just wondering, at what point in time do we reconcile if they've made the decision to join one care on one, two, or three payers, but their budget doesn't accurately reflect that they're in yet? you know, that there's more information coming out in the next two weeks from some of these hospitals that are in negotiations now. How do we deal with that? Um, I'm going to um, look to the team on this, but my first thought is that um, we definitely would want to um, look at that in actuals for sure, because if they um, if they begin participating, it will start part way through the fiscal year. Um, on one one, they'll start to get those monthly payments, at least um, for Medicare and Medicaid, um, if they're participating in all the programs. And um, we would, uh, you would think start to see that in actuals and do some reconciliation at that point. I mean, it really means that less fee for service revenue, more FPP. Do you, um, Lauren and Kelly, do you have any other thoughts about that? The only thing I can think of is it materially changes the NPR and FPP calculation but if it's not, and it's just a change and reclass patient, I would think that you don't have any changes. Or we just still change it so that we take into consideration the PP. I think for the, the 2020 process, um, we could probably put together a reconciliation of some sort for this year. So we could look at how the different hospitals recorded things this year and get an apples to apples comparison for this year versus, or for 2019 versus 2020. 
I just wanted to add one thing, you know, on the ACO accounting. It just, you know, was said out there that how the hospitals have submitted it and how we roll it up can be different and probably will be different. Um, you know, specifically as we talk about risk, I understand some of the hospitals, you know, feeling the need to put that risk into their PL and talking to their auditors, and they may need to have that in there. Um, I would strongly put out that I don't think it should be a reduction of NPR, and it could go into an other revenue category if we needed to, because that clearly is a differentiation between the hospitals that put it as a reduction of NPR. Um, I'll point out Porter did a $2 million, which is fairly significant, um, versus other hospitals that didn't, and so we're kind of comparing apples to oranges there. So you know, I think we are going to need to make that determination. We may say that we allow them to put risk into their budget, but it may not affect the NPR calculation, you know, year over year. Otherwise, we're disadvantaging some of the other people who don't put that risk in. Yeah, Maureen's been a tremendous help to this team in general, um, really has um, served as a mentor for us, um, but has been particularly um, focused and articulate on, on this issue. So um, there's definitely some uh, apples to oranges, or at least uh, Granny Smith to Red Delicious to comparisons. Kind of so, thank you. Can I just chime in on that? <clears throat> I would be interested in other people's thoughts about how that either induces or doesn't induce hospitals to take risk in general. Like, do if we if in terms of whether or not it's in the NPR calculation, it seems like to some extent that kind of privileges people who stay in fee for service. So I don't know. I'm just I'm sort of thinking out loud here. So I just pose that for as for people to think about that. Yeah, I would, I would almost say the opposite in some cases because it depends. Like if, if a hospital books risk, right, and they actually book the risk into their P&L, then they're absorbing, they're supposed to get 100 million and their risk is 3 million. So they actually, you know, book $3 million worth of risk and they take that to the bottom line on the P&L. They actually have to make that up somehow by either increasing rate or, you know, because they're losing that $3 million. I, I do understand that they're, they couldn't necessarily absorb that $3 million in their P&L, but, you know, on one hand, this risk is upside or downside. So it could be $3 million favorable and $3 million unfavorable. So it's, it's a tough one as far as if it's, I think you're, if, if we said, to, if we made a directive that some hospitals are putting risk in and all should, that certainly would probably be a disincentive for hospitals to do it because how can all of a sudden somebody book, you know, some of these bigger hospitals book $10, $11 million of risk onto their P&L and hit their number? So it's a... Yeah, it's a tough one. Yeah. Thank you. I appreciate your thoughts on that. And my concern is, you know, we faced this last year. If they book the risk and then increase the rate to cover it, it's right. not really risk. Right. That's true. Right. right. So right. we have to make sure that we're managing that. Yeah. And, and that makes sense to me because, but, and maybe I'm being too simplistic, it seems like depending on the hospital, booking either making it up is great to me is a different issue from the NPR, although they're obviously connected, depending on the hospital and what their volumes are. Yeah. Okay, ready to move on? Sure. So um, what, what we did um, for each hospital, I'll just give you, um, we're not gonna go through all of this data for every hospital, we're just gonna hit the high points. Um, but what we did, um, just to give you a tour using Brattleboro's, was um, first we identified what we thought were some key financial indicators um, reflecting health, financial health. Um, the uh, fiscal year 19 budget operating margin and then days cash on hand. So two metrics that might give you a sense of how the hospital is doing. Um, we then um, showed the fiscal year 18 approved budget. And then if there were any adjustments um, that were um, recommended by the hospital, we put those in as well. And so this is an example, um, you know, this is the Brattleboro adjustment 
Congressman. Um, speaking of ACO risk, um, last year for Brattleboro, um, they um, built the risk in and then they raised their rates to cover the risk. And so we, we um, the board indicated that that wouldn't really be risk. So in the order, their um, rate was reduced, but their NPR was also reduced. And the way that they accounted for um, that risk, it didn't um, impact their NPR. So um, it was reduced when it really wasn't in the NPR. And so they had brought this to our attention um, of, uh, of right after last year's budget hearings, actually, and after the orders came out. And um, we were going to deal with it in the spring, but with the transition, that didn't happen. And um, so they are requesting that their 18 um, budget um, have that 1.3 million restored. Um, then we um, then we show um, the 19 proposed budget and then the NPR growth rate. Um, if there's an adjustment, we show the growth rate with and without the proposed adjustment. So without Brattleboro's $1.3 million adjustment to 18, um, it's a 6.5% NPR growth rate. With that adjustment, it would be a 4.8% um, NPR growth rate. Then we show the health care reform investments if they propose any of the amount and what the percentage is of um, NPR. So that will give you a sense of whether it's over or under the 0.4% allowance. Um, a note about which ACO programs, if any, that they're participating in. In the case of Brattleboro, they were one of the early adopters and are participating in all three ACO programs in 18. Um, and then the rate request. So in their case, it's 4.9% um, is the requested um, rate increase. And then we show the estimated value of what a 1% rate increase is worth. In their case, it's just under $400,000. And then we outline the decision points for you. So in this case, the decisions are, um, do you accept the proposed adjustment to that fiscal year 18 base NPR? Um, do you accept their proposed health reform investments? Do you accept their proposed NPR? Um, if not, um, what NPR would you accept? And same with the rate increase. So let me stop there and see, is this, you know, hopefully this is helpful information. I think this is very helpful and gives us a good template as you go across all 14. I would just say that um, for me, um, I actually thought they made a compelling argument to for the adjustment. And um, I'm not convinced though that they made a compelling argument that they should have the 4.8 which is 1.6 over the guidance. And I think that's for a much further discussion, but I'm just curious if other board members felt that uh, they made a compelling argument as well for the uh, uh, adjustment to the uh, base NPR. Um, before, before I go there, um, I do think they did. I think that's something we should just resolve last year. Um, uh, however, it's tough when they do it now and they're not even hitting that number and they're hitting their, you know, where they came in. But I do think they, they should get that. Um, just to, just on the format of this chart, um, I would tend to add, just ask if you could add two things, which is a total margin, not just operating margin, because many of the hospitals um, are showing, you know, some, some good solid numbers in that. And they actually, you know, as we saw today, some target 0% on their operating margin because they have money elsewhere there. So I'd like to see that. And then on the ACO, um, to the extent you could put in, um, maybe put in two numbers. One, what's the total risk that they um, believe that they need to be absorbing on the downside? And if they put any of that into their P&L, and I know some of them were still trying to figure out what they do, whether they budget it or and, where they don't budget it, but they book it in actual, so there's some disconnects there, but clearly some hospitals put some of that into the numbers, and understanding if it is and where would be good. Um, but to, to Kevin's first point on the um, 
Uh, yeah, the, the 4.8, we, we just uh, didn't do that correctly last year, and they did come in for an adjustment, and we should have just adjusted that, is my point of view on that. Um, I won't go into the other ones. And just to answer your question, Kevin, I, I agree that it should be an adjustment. I think I was in the room with you when we had the first conversation with them last fall, and I, I think somehow, some way, it just didn't get accomplished, but I agree with you. So maybe we could just start with that as the, where they're starting with. Does anybody Others disagree? disagree? I'm, I wasn't here, but I've read the material, uh, and it goes back to right after the decision was made, so it's been on the table. Yes. It's not a surprise. It seems reasonable to me. Okay. I would agree. Um, I have one other comment about this hospital, if yes. I can jump in. Um, so, um, Brattleboro in their health care reform investments included both the ACO fee, which is something that we explicitly list as an example of allowable, but they also included the deductions from the fixed per perspective payment for the primary care PMPM PM, and the care management fees. I think that is the deduction, so we need to check that. That would be different from what we've done in the past, and since those payments are basically a redirect from the hospital to primary care, if, the hus if it's going back to the hospital through the primary care, it doesn't make sense to me that it would also be a health care reform investment that allows for additional NPR. Uh, Rutland is the other hospital that did this. They're in a different situation in terms of their primary care, but we should have a discussion about how we want to handle that because that's something that could affect any hospital in the ACO. So I, I haven't talked to staff about sort of their thinking on this. It's probably premature to make a decision on that today, but it is an issue that we need to resolve. So one of the things on that, Robin, is that um, what I think we really need staff to do, like in this particular case, um, they talked about a 1% uh, allowance for health care reform. We're allotting a 0.4, and so the discussion on this one may be mute. Right. If, um, if the allowable, if is, the allowable is still covered by the 0.4. The yeah. 0.4. Yeah. So, we, we're going to need those calculations really on. Um, I think it did go over because I was looking at that when I was myself looking at it. So I okay. think it, it would result potentially in a below the point four. If I'm right, that it is the deduction from FTP. Okay, we will. Uh, we'll um, we'll see what we can do to uh, quantify that for you. Just a um, quick question about process. So um, I I anticipate today that we would sort of lay out what the decision points are for each hospital. But I understand that there's you know what you might consider some low hanging fruit um, decisions that you can make today. So um, you know if the board is prepared adjustment to um, make a decision. I guess my question is, does it re require a motion and, um, and so forth? So I'm not so sure it necessarily requires a motion. The motion would be whatever we end up with the final NPR. Okay. And clearly the board has agreed to that adjustment. Okay. And I just want to add something on process too, Pat. I didn't anticipate any votes on any of the hospitals today. I thought this was laying everything out. Um, for what other information might be needed. There were suggestions here already, so I, I wasn't anticipating that. Um, when we're talking about low-lying fruit, that would just be more policy discussion and things that you may want to go back and look at for the board that they want to take a different view on or want some additional information. So contrary to Judy's point of view, any kind of decisions that we can make today, I think we should, because I remember the anxiety that was created last year when we got down to, I think it might have been the final four of hospitals um, in that final week of decision making. I don't want to go through that again. I'd rather start proceeding to, to get rid of some decision points that can be made so that we're not stuck, to, and we probably will still get stuck in that same, same point that we were in last year, making some very difficult decisions in, in what I consider to be too hurried a manner. Um, so, um, I'm just trying to expedite this process. Yes, and I just want to also remind you that we still have an open comment period also, so as far as making any of the ultimate decisions, I would um, yeah, advise no, you to hold off on any of We're advice. not going to vote on the ultimate NDRs or the ultimate rates today um, until after that comment period is finished, 
but I think that clearly we can determine which hospitals we think we could finish shortly after the public comment period ending on September 10th, which would be September 12th, and try to get uh, the framework in place so that we can have those votes when we come in next Wednesday, um, and then turn the discussions on the ones that we can't finish up and continue to try to make progress towards that so that all final decisions would be made um, by the 12th. So, fifth and, fifth and 12th, I guess it is. Okay. Um, so, I'll um, actually just uh, quickly move through the next um, few hospitals and then um, I'm going to, Kelly and uh, Lori are going to help as well so that you have to listen to me the whole time. Um, so, for Central Vermont Medical Center, um, some of the key elements are that they are um, requesting two proposed adjustments. One is um, almost $2.6 million for an ACO accounting change, and that's um, basically how they accounted for their ACO participation fees. Um, and that would um, increase the 18 base. And then they also have some um, provider transfers that they um, had requested be added into the 18 base. One um, provider transfer that they requested was the one that Kevin alluded to earlier, which was, um, it was 251,000 um, for a dermatologist um, who will not be um, present until 10-1 of 18, which is um, fiscal year 19. The staff is prepared at this point to recommend that that um, that that transfer not be um, included as an adjustment to the fiscal year 18 base because obviously it's not part of fiscal year 18. Does anyone on the board disagree with that? Okay. Okay. Uh, yeah, we've got to talk about the accounting change. Um, just on the accounting change on this one and for the UVM network, I mean, what I would propose is that we keep it the way that we normally, that we have looked at it historically. I do understand that this may be the way that they need to change it um, on their reporting, but will be kind of half the hospital or half the total ACO piece would be done one way, which is an NPR, and half wouldn't be done that way. And I think it's harder for us to make that decision on that. So they may need to account for it where they account for it, but I would suggest that we look at it, you know, apples to apples this year. And as we talked about, we need a separate group during the course of the year to just hash out how we look at it. So just to clarify, you're recommending that we not adjust the 18 budget for that accounting change? Correct. So I, maybe I'm confused, but I thought that the difference was the way the other hospitals in, are doing it this year and these guys had done it last year is that they just hit the net of the FPP minus the withholds and they the, the net was included that in the NPR. Am I wrong about that? Yeah. And that what they did this year is they put the whole thing in and then subtracted it out later? Yeah, what they did is um, the net um, is how everybody was doing it. What they did this year for, for 2019 is they took all the um, participation fees and they put that in expenses. So it's completely out of NPR. So they have some of their ACO stuff in expenses where everybody else has it net of NPR. So we would have to make adjustments on our schedule, though, to adjust their expenses out of expense and put it a net of NPR to make it apples to apples. It shouldn't be that far off what they're saying, so what we're showing in our schedules is not correct either because the way we reported it in our schedules was 2018 as they had it, and then 2019 with a higher inflated NPR, if you will, and money down in expenses. So what we're showing on our analysis is not correct either. It's gonna be closer to what they have, but. 
we're showing on our analysis of what the hospitals would do. We need to change in but their 2018 budget has it netted in NPR, and their 2019 budget has it in expenses. Well, all I'm saying is it's however they reported it, we did not change anything. The other thing that I understood, and I'm probably misunderstanding, is the UVM network, those fees were actually to true up fiscal year 17 of they're 17 to true it up to match the ACO's fiscal year 18. So last year had um, from September through December was their fiscal year, um, our fiscal year 18, but it was the hospital, the ACO's 17. So that's some of that money that's in there too. Did I understand? <coughs> So it's a complicated issue that we definitely have to discuss with all of the hospitals. But it makes sense to me that we want it to all be the same. So I think it makes sense for us to then change their submission so that it's the net, like it was last year. And that way we have apples to apples for NPR and not an inflated. Right, I think now to help make the decision and then you know, part of it is because we didn't find out about it until they put their submission in, although their auditors told them about this in January or February. So we potentially could have had some time to work through this, but we found out about it when the budget submission came through and then they made this accounting change. So I think we should just look at it the way we've historically looked at it. Um, so we can um, try and put some looks together on this, uh, you know, get a little more concrete on it to give you all something to react to. How does that sound for next week? Sounds yes. good. Okay. Um, so uh, Central Vermont, um, without the proposed adjustments, their NPR would increase um, by 6.5%. Um, with all adjustments, it would increase by 5%, obviously, with the um, to the removal of the dermatology adjustment, it's going to end up somewhere in between, and we'll get that figure for you. And of course, we don't know what will happen in the ACO accounting either. Um, they did also um, request 0.4% uh, in uh, their reform investments, and they, of course, are participating in all three ACO programs in 18. Their rate request is a 2.8% increase. Estimated value of the 1% would be about 1.2 million. And so again, your decision points um, around the adjustments, you've made one decision already, um, healthcare reform investments, NPR, and rate increase. Copley, um, has proposed a budget that would represent an NPR growth rate of 5.9%. Um, there are no proposed adjustments to their budget. They did um, request some uh, in healthcare reform investments, just over 66,000. That represents 0.1% of NPR, so it doesn't um, rise to the 0.4% allowance. So if you were to um, use your guidance from earlier in the year, they would be looking at potentially if all their healthcare reform investments were approved, um, a, a target of 2.9% rather than 3.2%. Um, they are not participating in ACO programs in 2018. All the hospitals are discussing um, potential participation, but um, we haven't heard um, from Copley at this point that they're definitely participating in 19. And then their um, fiscal year 19 rate request is 7.9%. Um, the value of a 1% rate increase is just under 400,000. Um, and the deci decision points here are whether to accept their proposed healthcare reform investments 
accept the proposed NPR and their rate increase. The next concept, where do you go? I have, can I just comment on, in, in the spirit of comments uh, on their health care reform investment? Uh, it was related to. Uh, it, the staff recommendation on their health care reform investment was to accept it, and I agree with that. So I don't know if anyone else had an issue with that or if we can just sort of say Copley is okay on their with their point one. With the 66351? Yeah. Does anybody disagree with that? I can tell you what it's for. Yeah, what's it for? It's for a social worker to work to continue to reduce ED utilization. Ryan Vermont Program Coordinator um, in Health Promotion. And, and, uh, so the social worker is new and the. It's an increase, so this is just the delta between 18 and 19. So and it is new. new. And RISE is new and the Health Promotion is new. And I believe there are some community grants yes, in there yep, as well. Yes, yep, thanks. The CNN. CHNA implementation plan. That's only ten thousand. I'll just say for that one, I had. I mean, it's ten thousand dollars, so it's it's not really the magnitude is not, maybe doesn't make it a problem. But here's my concern of that: it's just a bucket of money that is to be allocated at some point later, and I that concerns me because I think that's a slippery slope to start approving a bucket of money to be allocated later. So. The fact that it's ten thousand dollars doesn't really worry me, but I am concerned about that as a precedent that would be setting. And would you um, want to either because we have them requiring reporting on past investments, so I think we could um, look at what that was actually spent on in the from the reporting, or we could disallow it. Yeah, I think we could look at. I mean, again, it's not a. It's not a big issue for me. It's just I want to raise the issue of precedent setting. Yeah. So no, I, I agree. Um, and if we start to go down the path of having to look at past reporting and justifying future yeah. reporting, then as those buckets get larger yeah. in the future, then we have to start looking at more past expenditures and assume that the future expenditures will look like the past expenditures. I don't know that we can do that. So I'm just raising the question. Maybe it's for a larger conversation later. But well, I guess this is not going to be an easy question to answer. So. I guess not. I thought I might be that it was a small amount we'll of money. Okay, we'll give you another right at the end. Um, and then, the, so the decision points here proposed health care reform investments, uh, proposed NPR, proposed rate uh, The next is Gifford. Um, uh, Gifford um, has a proposed NPR growth of minus. 6.1 percent. You'll probably remember from our earlier discussions on um, fiscal year 17 actuals that um, they, they were running quite a bit under budget. Um, so their NPR growth rate is minus 6.1 percent. Um, they did um, request a $590,000 health care reform investment um, that would um, be worth way over four percent allowance it comes in at one percent um, they are not participating in ACO programs in 2018 and they um, spent quite a bit of time talking about you know a glide path for them to begin to participate they are definitely one of the hospitals in discussion you know I'll just note that with a minus 6.1 percent NPR growth rate they are um, well under the um, 2.8 percent um, uh, target that you all set in the guidance. They're also running even lower than the minus 6.1 in their projections for um, 18, but um, they don't have to have health care reform investments in order to meet your, your target. Their rate request is at 4 percent. Um, and the estimated value of 1% of the rate is um, 402000 And so the decision points, again, um, if you want to um, make a decision on their health reform investments, their NPR and their rate increase. So I 
to me, the healthcare reform investment isn't a decision point because they don't need it to make the target. Right. So I, I just would say with any hospital where I, I appreciate getting the information and knowing what they what they're investing in. So I, I like getting the information, but if I would just not I wouldn't approve or disapprove. I would just say you don't need it. We don't need to get to that question. Looks like there's consensus on that. One last thing to yeah. <laughs> that makes sense to me. All right. Anything else on different? Okay, Grace Cottage. Um, they are uh, proposing NPR growth of 3.5% over um, 18. They did not request adjustments, nor did they request health reform investments. Um, if they had, the 0.4% allowance would have been close to 75,000. They are not participating in ACO programs in 2018. Their rate request is for 3.2%. The value of 1% of rate increase is 88,000. The decision points are around NPR and the rate increase. Okay. Um, Pat, one thing actually that would be helpful to you on these is to show where their trend, where their 18 trends are as well. Um, and I guess you could put two numbers in. One is budget to budget, but then so budget 18 to budget 19. I'm sorry, that's yeah. But the other is um, for 18, where their actuals are coming in because. You know, this one, you know, this would be one we could probably start to move pretty quickly, but their NPR growth at 3.5, they're missing their number this year, so. I, I strongly support that. It's, it's <clears throat> for a few hospitals, the world between budget to budget and, and projected 2018 to budget are very different, and I think they're important to have them right in our faces as we're, as we're thinking about that hospital. Okay. We have a sheet. I don't know if this is helpful, but I've been looking at this sheet right. with this sheet. And, and to me, between the two, I don't need everything all on one page. But that's just me. No, you're right. We do have that chart. So um, just to bring this point up too, Pat, because this, this and, uh, and Bob Scutney, uh, as far as the health reform investments being uh, a zero request, if you're looking at that 3.5 versus uh, 2.8. And I know that we did extend the olive branch to Mama Scotty to come back to us to try to define any healthcare investments we might want to, if we're going to be fair to everyone, if we're going to do that with Mama Scotty, we might want to extend that same request to Grace Cottage. Okay. Um, we're happy to do that. We'll reach out to them. Um, I found Grace Cottage's more definitive in their narrative that they weren't um, proposing um, health reform investments. Um, Mount of Scutney's was a little, I, it was a little unclear then and they um, came today with a really pretty impressive list of <laughs> health care reform investments. It seemed clear to me that, um, you know, those tables were a little confusing because we had two different tables, one looking at prior health reform investments and one looking at the proposed for 19. So um, I'll make a commitment to you all that we'll um, try to um, provide more clarity around that should you decide to um, offer an allowance for health care reform investments next year. Okay. And then the last hospital I'll cover is Mount Scotney Hospital and Health Center. Um, as you heard today, uh, Mount Scotney is um, coming in at an NPR growth rate of 5.2%. Um, I um, don't believe that they are asking for zero dollars in healthcare reform investment, so we'll circle back at that as we just said. Um, they are participating in um, the Medicaid ACO program in 2018, but as I think we heard today, they're planning to participate in all three in 2019, so that's notable. Um, the rate request is 2.9%. Uh, I'll just um, sort of note that I found it interesting that they, um, they are focused on a 
attempting to reduce um, rate increases and that they um, seem to be suggesting that they would prefer a more fluid process where if they were coming in um, with revenues higher than anticipated that they might be open to um, making an adjustment part way through the year. Um, so just sort of put that out as food for thought that when you make your decisions, um, you might, um, you know, you might choose to put something to that effect into the um, budget order. And so the decisions here are again um, on NPR and the rate increase. Uh, actually, you just made a really good point about thought it was notable that they might be in for all three. I'm wondering if you could just add that to the template for those hospitals. I mean, I know some are on the fence, but the hospitals that through the hearings have committed to all three or one or two. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, 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 the ones that I heard most commit, and correct me if I missed anybody, but definitely um, Matt was got me, and Rutland was the other one that seemed to clearly state that uh, their plan is to participate in Medicaid only for uh, 19. Um, we'll, we'll go back in our notes and see if there were others, but those were the two that stood out for me. But even just knowing what Springfield, for example, is in for all three would be helpful in Springfield page or mm -hmm. Northwestern. Mm -hmm. You know, being in for all three, four, being in well, I put those on the that's yeah. on this sheet. Okay. If they, if they're, well, I mean, what's in there? Okay, you raise a good point because what's in there is that they participate in 18. I was sort of making a presumption because we've heard nobody that's currently participating saying that they're dropping out. So, but we can clarify and that. Just, are you saying add what we heard for 19 as far as we know today? Because right. some of them are going to have to. Yeah, yes, yeah. Okay. That'd be great, thank you. All right, so um, at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Kelly, and she's mm -hmm. going to cover the hospitals that start with the north and the plus one. <laughs> uh, so starting with North Country Hospital, um, they submitted a proposed NPR growth of 3.1%. They have no proposed adjustments. Um, for healthcare reform investments, their request amounted to 0.5%, and they are participating in the Medicaid ACO program for 2018. Their FY19 rate request is 3.6%, and the value, estimated value of 1% of that rate increase is just under $650,000. Your decision points here are accepting whether or not to accept the proposed health care reform investments, accept the proposed NPR, and to accept the proposed rate increase. So I'm going to make another stab at it. They're, and they're also, they are in for all programs in 2019 uh, for the ACO. And their two health care reform investments are for an ACO care coordinator and the increase in the ACO goes dues from 18 to 19. Uh, and the staff recommendation on both of those were to approve. So unless anybody objects, I would say go with that. Just to take one thing off the table. Well, I want to be careful what I'm uh, agreeing to. Um, because I came out to more than the point four. Right. Well, the point four by our guidance is the cap. So right. I'm in no case. So, but but they're less than, than the, the three point two. So. Oh yeah. Never mind. So my point is that. We don't need it. Yeah. Uh, you would oh, partially need it because the cap is two point three. Right. So okay. we be approving point three yeah. to get them up to the three point one. Correct. Is, is that a yes? Is that a yes? <laughs> yes. Yeah. yes. Okay. <laughs> Just checking. <laughs> okay, anything else on North Country? Okay, moving on to Northeastern. Um, they did propose an adjustment to the FY18 base um, for a provider transfer, uh, which was already approved. Um, cardiology transferred from CBMC to NBRH. Um, their NPR growth without the proposed adjustment would be 5.0%, and their growth with the proposed adjustment would be 4.8%. For 
For healthcare reform investments, they requested $300,000, which is 0.4%, um, and they are not participating in ACO programs in 2018, and we heard about 2019 as well. Um, for FY19, the rate request is 4.0%, and the estimated value of 1% is $384,400. Your decision points here are to accept the proposed adjustment to the FY18 base. Can you remind us what those were, Kelly? For which? For the proposed adjustments. What were the... It's just the provider, just the provider transfer that was already approved. So your staff recommendation would be, would be to approve that. So that's one that we could probably take off the table. Well, if it's already approved, it, we wouldn't yeah. really need to reapprove it either. Yep. Yeah. So yeah, we were assuming that that was <laughs> where we were going. Um, so then the others would be to accept the proposed health reform investments, accept the proposed NPR, and to accept the proposed rate request. Are there health reform investments? Sorry, Jess. No, I think you're going to say what I was going to say, so go for it. Um, so they, they were here, they were a maybe on the 2019 Medicaid, and their investment was uh, at least, in, I, I can pull it up in front of me, but 200,000 was for either the ACO dues or the Accountable Communities for Health. Um, and so I, I think we do need to clarify which they're talking about, and if it is for the accountable communities for health at that dollar value, then I, I want to know what it's for. I'll just note that um, one of our follow-up questions to them was, um, you know, if it was the accountable community for health, how would they be measuring success on that? And um, we did get some follow-up from Laura Ruggles like at 6 a.m. in the morning after she was here, um, telling us, uh, you know, with a with a set of measures that they um, that they are using to um, to look it out. But what are they actually using the money for? Was my question. Okay, that's yeah, that's a different question. The other thing that you should be prepared to come in with for next week's meeting is um, this was one of those hospitals that we gave. Um, in last year's budget orders, I think I recall it correctly, uh, the ability to exceed last year's guidance and they're right back here again this year. And I think that that would be important information for us to have when we're making these decisions. Yeah, I think there's a few others too that fall in that boat. At least one other. <laughs> Anything else on Northeastern? Okay, moving on to the last of the North. Uh, Northwestern. Um, they uh, did propose an adjustment. They did a pro propose an adjustment to the base, uh, which again was a transfer that was approved um, the absorption of their occupational health into the hospital. Um, so with the proposed adjustment, that would be 3.2% NPR growth requested. Um, without that adjustment, which has been approved uh, previously, would be 6.3 percent. Can I clarify? They had, yeah, they had sure. four or five adjustments yeah. that were proposed. Some were for the for one was approved, which Brett and you just yeah. described. There were three others, and among those three others, some of them. This is why I brought up earlier. Some of them were for new services yeah. that didn't exist in the community already. Okay. We'll so clarify that. Yeah. yeah, this is an area where I think we yeah, have to deep dive. Definitely. So we'll get we'll get that to you as well. Uh, for health reform investments, uh, they did request 0.4 percent increase there, um, and they are participating in all three ACO programs in 18 and 19 as well. Um, for FY19, their rate request is 2.0 percent, and the estimated value of a 1 percent increase in rate is just under 530 thousand dollars. The decision points there would be whether or not to accept the proposed adjustments to the FY18 base NPR, whether or not to accept the proposed health reform investments, whether or not to accept the proposed NPR, and whether or not to accept the proposed rate increase. For Porter Medical Center, um, the proposed adjustment to the FY18 
2019 rebased budget, which was rebased, we did make a note of that here, um, is an increase for the ACO accounting change, which is similar, similar to the CBMC change that Pat described earlier. Um, for NPR growth, without the proposed adjustment would be 4.5%, and the NPR growth with the proposed adjustment is 3.2%. For healthcare reform investments, they did request the full 0.4% for FY19, and they are participating in all three ACO programs for 2018. For FY19, the rate, in, rate request is 2.8%, for commercial only, um, and negative 1% overall. The estimated value of 1% is just under $397,000. Uh, your decision points here are whether or not to accept the proposed adjustment to the base, whether or not to accept the proposed health reform investments, whether or not to accept the proposed NPR, and whether or not to accept the proposed rate increase. And I would just add that another potential decision is um, uh, what to do with the ACO risk. Um, as Maureen articulated earlier, um, that it has um, sort of suppressed their, uh, their NPR. Yeah, this one, that was significant change, that three points to their request that it can go up by $2 million. Yeah. Um, another thing, I want to throw out for discussion, um, and they put it on the chart for the two hospitals that are re that we rebased. Um, we rebased um, because of overperformance in 17, and we made some adjustments um, for that 17. When we rebased 18, we didn't do anything as far as we rebased them, but we didn't talk about any overages that may occur with that. So I'd like to at least see where their operating profits are for 18, what their budget was and what they were projecting for the two hospitals that we rebased for 18 without doing anything on their bottom line. So I just want to clarify, because we didn't rebase for 18, the motion that we voted on rebased it for 19. So they're, they're still subject to that uh, half a percent uh, variance on what we actually approve for the 18 budgets. And that's what Jesse's motion had been when we made that uh, vote was to rebase it for 19, not for 18. It's still the same request. Look at what they're doing on their overage for both of those. Can I just throw out something that this might be crazy? So, but and it relates to what you're all talking about with UVM Medical Center Porter and CVMC, and I'm just wondering. This is the first year that they actually presented an entire budget together, you know, in sort of a system-wide look. Um, and I'm just, I want to just throw out this concept of, do we treat them as a system in our budget order to the degree that, uh, and I don't know that we can even do this this year, so this is why I may be crazy, but to the degree that the UVM Medical Center is trying to push back uh, care to the CBMC and Porter, we're going to see higher NPR in those hospitals if they're actually trying to move the, the care to the local communities. It should be offset by lower care at UVM Medical Center. That can all be accomplished if we actually treat the entire network as a system and impose an NPR for the whole system and actually have them manage to it and impose a rate increase to the whole system and have them manage to that. I'm just wondering if it's too late in the game to do that or do we even think about that or is this just crazy justice speaking? Well, I would say that at this point, with two weeks left to go, I don't see how we change the rules of the game for this year. But it's certainly something that should be discussed next year. Um, I mean, my, my, my sense is, is to stay the course, with, because that's what we've been working on. But it might be helpful uh, if we had the information as to what it looks like system-wide, because I, obviously that's a track that I think they want us to be on and we want to be on. And we can at least start the, uh, you know, and I think it is easy to blend three. Um, we can start to see what they look like um, as an entire entity. 
I would just add that the board could certainly consider that as a factor when making decisions. I mean, you know, it's not too late to say, we'll look at this system line. I mean, you can do it. Um, it, it, it you know, it could be a mitigating factor in some of your decisions, if you wish it to be. What I like about the idea is it, it promotes moving the care to the lower cost setting. Mm -hmm. yeah, I agree. I think we could look at this consideration. Okay. Thank you. Next is Rutland Regional Medical Center. They came in with a uh, FY19 uh, growth submitted with 3.2%. Um, they gave us a revised NPR growth of 3.1% at the presentation this week. They had um, and part of that is because of the ACO. Uh, information that they received later in their submission. They have health reform investments of the 0.4% and they were not participating in ACO programs in 2018, but they are in 19 for Medicaid. Uh, Rutland submitted a 3% rate request, but at their presentation told us they're now requesting a 2.6%. The decision point for Rutland is do you accept the proposed health reform investments, their NPR, and their rate increase? How's that? Any questions on Rutland? No, I mentioned it earlier. I'll just say it again. My only question on Rutland um, is I think we do have to discuss their inclusion of the deductions from the FPP, at, which is their health care reform investment, part of their health care reform investment. Southwestern. Southwestern came in with a proposed adjustment for their FY18 base, which included the dental home, 581,310, because we approved their CON last year, right in the middle of our uh, hospital budget process. So their proposed adjustment was 3.6% for NPR growth. With this adjustment, it brings it to 3.2%. Their health reform and investment. Is, is the staff prepared to make a recommendation on the Practice. Yes, so accept it, please. Does anybody disagree with accepting? No, no because I think, quite frankly, we approved it in their CON. Yeah, so yeah, exactly. <laughs> we approved the NPR and so, that. So you can take that decision point away. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, back to the health reform investments. They are requested 1.1%, which is equal to uh, a little shy of 1,800,000 but their allowance was only worth 638000 They are participating in the Medicaid ACO program for 2018, and I'm not sure for 19. I can't remember if they said all three here. I don't think they've decided yet. I think they're still waiting, if I recall. Yeah, that's my recollection, is they'll stick with Medicaid, Medicaid and they're yes. considering the other two. That's what I, for dollars, it look like Medicaid from what yeah. we were seeing. Um, their FY19 rate request was 3.2%, and the estimated value of 1% rate increase is a little more than $800,000. Your decision points, if you uh, want to accept this budget, would be, as we already talked about, the adjustment to the NPR, the health reform investments, the NPR rate percent, and the proposed rate increase. And I think they were going to get back. Robin had some great questions about the reduction in total cost of care related to the health reform investment of tele ICU. They were going to get back to us with data. So that was well, yeah, the after, after, wasn't that going to be quite a bit after? 
Uh, uh, Steve uh, Majedic said that he had a slide deck that he could share, and I, we sent that question out okay. yesterday morning. Now, he went on vacation today. I can't say I saw anything in my email, but hopefully he delegated it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, and the only other, uh, on their health care reform investments, that as you know, they have, uh, their request is larger than the allowance. Um, so this is probably less of a big deal, but we did talk with them about their planning costs for the IT, and I think we could have a larger discussion about IT as a health care reform investment. And to me, like there, if it's directly connected to changing the operations, like upgrading to include a shared care plan or something like that, that to me is very connected to the operational change, that makes sense. In this case, it was like improving their fiber optic cables and sort of prep costs that I, you would need to do with any IT change. So I personally wouldn't allow that million, but quite frankly, they don't need it to reach the point four. So I don't think it necessarily would impact that, depending on what happens with the tele ICU. I would concur with um, that, Robin. I think it would maybe a little tweet, um, you know, um, Upgrading your electronic health record can have um, major impacts on um, your ability to do care management, um, quality improvement, population health. So, um, you know, there is an argument for um, IT to, and for and particularly work around electronic health records to be um, considered health reform. In this case, um, while that's their ultimate goal, this was really a $1 million planning um, expense, as Robin said, to really sort of get the system prepped for that um, ultimate, um, I think they're planning to migrate to Epic. Um, and you know, that again, there's some compelling arguments where um, you know, partner organizations, Dartmouth Hitchcock Health uses Epic, and it certainly could enhance care management. But because it was planning phase, I think that's why the staff felt like it didn't really rise yet to a healthcare reform investment. And as Robin indicated, they don't need it to meet the 0.4. For Springfield, Springfield, there's also going to be a discussion on their risk reserve for risk, but they had a proposed FY19 NPR budget growth of one percent, and they have health reform investments uh, of zero. They were allowed two hundred thirty. $8,000, and they participated in all three ACO programs for 2018, and I believe for 19. And their FY19 rate request is 5%, which is an estimated value of 1% rate increase is equal to close to $319,000. Your decision points would be to accept the proposed NPR and the rate increase. Last but not least, UVM. UVM was one of the hospitals that we rebased for FY19 purposes. We rebased their 19 budget. And they also have a accounting change for the ACO worth close to $8 million. So their proposed budget without any adjustments, their growth would be 1.7% of NPR. If you accepted the adjustment for NPR, it would be worth 1.1%. The hospital's health reform investments, they requested 8,572,000, which is equal to 0.7%, but they were allowed only 5,009,188. They are participating in all three ACOs for 2018 and 19. For their FY19 rate request, they are requesting 4% for commercial and 3% overall. 
We estimated the value of 1% commercial rate to equal 4,500,353. The 1% overall rate was equal to 6,337,346. The year decision points are to accept the proposed adjustments to their 18 base for their NPR, their health performer investments, their proposed NPR, and the proposed rate increase. So again, on health reform, we're, we're talking about uh, uh, a number that's below what the guidelines were. So I, I think that's kind of a viewpoint. Um, what is the staff recommendation on the proposed adjustment to the NPR? We, we need more time to this ACO okay. adjustments. Okay. <laughs> So I think that walks us through all 14. Yeah. Just on, on UBM, we did request, right, to get more validation on their NPR growth because it will be about 13 million when we, even if we reset them back, you know, when we reset the ACO back, it's a year over year increase of 13 million. Um, and the past four years, I think you guys ran, they've done between 40 and 60 million a year. Right. So my Concern on this one is we're making decisions, including rate and things like that, on what I challenged is going to be really difficult to hit only a $13 million increase when their rate increases alone are $25 million. So they're going down year over year. We, we checked, I think, the past four years, they've had like a 40, a 60, a 40, a 30, you know, so. I don't know how, you know, it looks like they're being very responsible, but the challenge is, are we going to be here next year? And they, they beat this number on the top line quite a bit. We had to approve rates to fit into that. So I know we did ask them for some support on that. Um, so that's going to be important to help make this decision. You know, they're the largest hospital in the network. So. Right. We're asking them that to provide that information that we have. I would just say that. They we're obviously not going to vote on this or reach consensus on this this afternoon, but clearly um, I'm, not, I'm not prepared to give them the rate increase that they asked for. So. Actually, can I jump in on that? Sure. The rate increase vote. Um, so one of the things that I've been looking at in thinking about how we deal with the commercial rate increase, I realize we just came off of this QHP filings where we cut, you know, the um, commercial rate effectively there, uh, or the premiums there, with the idea that we're actually going to come in lower on our hospital budgets than were submitted. And I think that we will in various places. But I've been looking at hospitals that have looked, asked for a commercial rate increase of over 3%, just as a kind of, OK, let's look at everybody over 3%, with which there are many. Um, and one of the things that I'm doing that I, I thought maybe might be helpful if you shared with other board members as part of the packet, or you all could look at as well, is I've been looking at um, the, you know, the data on the charge master from the Department of Health. You know, what is the charge? You know, what are the gross charges for various uh, procedures in patient and outpatient? Trying to look at whether or not the hospitals that are asking for very high rate increases are they already above the average, at least in gross charges? So, for example, if you look at Gifford. Gifford is, is asking for a relatively high uh, commercial rate increase. They're really above the average in gross charges by a lot, sometimes double the average for the state. So to me, that raises a very large red flag. The other piece of data that I believe it was Robin that pointed out, which has, I found helpful, is looking at the total cost of care by HSA in the blueprint profiles. And again, for example, Gifford is an outlier there as being really expensive. So for me, I'm concerned about giving them another rate increase when they're already an outlier. So I think that data might be helpful for the board to have in front of them or for everybody to look at is, you know, what are the, what are the gross charges? And I realize gross charges are not, you know, the actual, you know, prices, but they're correlated. And as we heard, they're usually a percentage off of gross. So I think it's just another vehicle and information and, and it's available online and I think it's helpful. But so. just to remind you that just in today's two hospitals, 
we heard one say 85% of their mm -hmm. charge sheet and the other said 70%. Mm -hmm. So that, that is a huge difference. It yeah, is. A lot of them were coming in at the 70%. I, um, Springfield, see, I mean, because when you asked the question um, earlier, um, you know, most of the hospitals were saying around 70%. It made me wonder if Springfield's charges are lower or, or something. They are a little lower. Yeah. yeah. Gross. So one of the hospitals, though, that said 70% is also one of the hospitals that I, I at least know anecdotally um, has one of the lowest percentage off of charges in their negotiations with at least one of the insurers. So I, the, the things didn't reconcile in my brain. I just think it's, yeah, it's just another data piece to add We'll more. see what we can do to, to pull that data, um, or at least send a link around so that folks can attend. I would do the blueprint as well as the, I mean, the total yeah, cost of care. Yeah, the blueprint is um, right online, but I mean, we'll, if we have time, we'll get it, we'll try to get it into a table. They're also in the, the reference those. library binders, yeah. too, so we have lots of access to them. So that's, um, I mean, we really today wanted to lay out the um, decision points. You've exceeded our expectations by actually <laughs> making a couple of decisions. And, uh, and, um, I'll lower you know, your expectations. <laughs> expectations yeah. as well mm -hmm. and um, it makes our job a lot easier when we're getting such great information from you so thank you very very much thank, thank, you. thank you so with that is there any old business to come before uh, the board yeah, and oh, well, can i just add to just as a maybe we just want to discuss the next steps and calendar and you just make sure everyone so the next steps are be available. Available because uh, I, I just realized that uh, the next board meeting which is December uh, September 5th yeah. is before the close of the public button. comment yeah exactly so my whole timeline has been thrown askew because I have truly <laughs> hoped to make some decisions on September Fifth, which I clearly cannot make now. Could we make a, um, you know, a, not a preliminary decision or a conditional? But it still leaves, it still leaves all 14 of them. Do you think you do a tentative and then the last day you go through the list again to reiterate? So which is what I exactly did not want to do, though, because uh, I felt like we made some hurried decisions last year um that so that's why tentative and then if you the ones you'd make on the 12th you oh well, we've got to go back and treat the other ones the same sometimes it gives you that i know you don't probably want to hear that but it might change your mind from what was decided on on the fifth that's what i'm afraid yeah. of <laughs> <laughs> but that's what's happened in the past yeah. the other thing i wonder if we want to uh maybe think about doing a longer board meeting on the 12th because yeah. that's also cons memorial so we're not going right. to have a lot of oh, time so to do we do we have the information on yeah, 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 5 30 on the 12th they're not there it's up in the college so that goes so we could schedule i mean we could plan on staying here well we have to be out of this room by four. the other the other thing I mean, probably right? people don't want to even have this suggested, but maybe we should schedule a board meeting on the 11th as well. Works to me. That's fine. So anybody? You? I teach in the morning. It would have to be in the afternoon. Definitely could be in the afternoon. afternoon. What time would you be able to be here by? My, my class ends at 12.15. So I get out by 12.30, and the earliest I'd be here would be 2. What about the time? Well, unfortunately, well, what if, public what if we just started in the morning? Yeah. Yeah. We can start in the morning on the 12th as well. We have this room all day. That's, that's a long day, but yeah, but that might be the easiest. Yeah, but to do all 14. Well, I think I think we could make some preliminary decisions yes. next week. Where you know either it's going to be like this one, where yay nay on the top line or the rate or where we go. 
points and discussion points, and then maybe we do all day the 12 or do the 11. What time does uh, the public comment officially end on the 10th? It's usually close of business. That's how we usually. That's how we usually count it. I was hoping to possibly. I know. <laughs> Well, one of the things that did, though, is Maureen said we went through and had some preliminary discussions that, and if anything changes our mind in the yeah. public comment, then we don't make any, we don't vote or anything on the fifth, but we sort of we went do, through. Yeah. Do a strong I think yeah. we're just going to have to make our best efforts, and uh, at the end of the day on the fifth, we'll have to make a decision whether or not we need to come in on the 11th mm -hmm. and two or not. But I, do think, I do think that irregardless of what we decide up until that point, we still should schedule that meeting um, to begin in the morning on the 12th because I don't want anything to interfere with the service. So. What time did you say it started around? 5.30. I, I just am not sure that we would need additional time on the 5th because we can't make final decisions. But it may help prep for what we do on the 12th, but. Well, we have nothing else on the agenda on the 5th. Yeah. On the 12th, we we have internal staff giving a data analysis presentation, and then the rest of the time is the hospital budget discussion and potential vote. A potential vote is already noticed on our calendar for the 5th. Which I think has to be on there for that timeline, doesn't it? The internal staff discussion has to be on there for we can look at the schedule. I think it. I think there. I think it may have to stay. But yeah, let so me so check on that on the twelfth. Right. Well, Marine's asking if that discussion from the twelfth could go to the fifth, but I'm not sure if it could. I'll, I'll look into it. Okay. Yeah. So, so I, I don't think it makes sense to start any earlier on the fifth, only because I don't think that. We're going to have a day long worth of discussion at that point. Unless you, if the rest of the board, I mean, I'm going to be here anyway, so I'm happy to meet starting in the morning on the 5th. That's what everybody wants to do. I don't care. I just need to know because I have a meeting I need to reschedule, which I could easily do. So I'm fine with it, or I'm fine either way. I just needed to come down the advance notice to reschedule something. What's well, everybody else's preference? I think we accomplish on the 5th enough, and then if we have the morning on the 12th through the afternoon of the 12th, I think we'll be able to. So we'll be. So what, what time do you want to start on the 5th? you still want to start at 1? Oh, yeah. Probably, yeah. Okay. nothing else on the calendar. On the That's day. all we have to talk about. It's just, yep. I mean, we have. Is there anything on the staff's plate? Or does that work for you guys? Everything we just gave them is on their plate. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Christina, we have this room until what time? Um, we have it every day from 9 to like 4 30. Every Wednesday, sorry. That's why it's easy to get in here earlier. On it may not be available the day that you are suggesting. Could you just uh, at least try to schedule one for the 11th in case we need it? Yeah, we can try. Okay. Okay. Is there any old business? Is there any new business? Okay. Anybody want to make a motion to adjourn? I move to adjourn. Second. It's been moved and seconded to adjourn. All those in favor seem to mind by saying aye. 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 Any opposed say no. See everybody on the